Well, welcome to week three of our series, Nothing But Net. I want to welcome all of our campuses, those joining online and those joining it, even in our prisons. We're just so glad that you are here. If you were not here for the first two weeks of this series, Pastor CJ spoke the first two weeks and, and he said, hey, we're trying to change the phrase from nailed it to nothing but net. And I would say those first two sermons were nothing but net. And if you have not seen those, you should go back online and watch those. And if you haven't discussed them, here would be something I would encourage you to do. In our app, every week, we have discussion questions based around the sermons. And I would encourage you to do that with your family, and I would also encourage you to do it with your life group. If you are not in a group, here's what I believe. Groups are where we get taught how to live out what the sermon just called out. And so if you are not in a group, you can go on the app right now, and you can actually look at our group finder tool and find a place to get plugged in and connected into a group. And here's one other thing I need you to do. And this one I really need you to do because nobody pulled out their phone for that first one. Here's this one. On the app, tonight, the brackets drop for the men's tournament and the women's tournament for nothing but nah, for March Madness. And we have a challenge going on here at the church. And you need to join in because I have brackets in each one of them. Nothing but Broadbeck, all right? I would challenge you to challenge me and to see if you have what it takes. So get on the app, join the group. We're gonna have some fun over the next month, kind of with March Madness as a church. We'd love you for you to do that. Well, my name's Kurt Broadbeck. I get to serve as one of the executive pastors here at Northview. And I told Pastor CJ, I was like, hey, you do realize you're not the only one on staff who played basketball. <laughs> and I have a basketball story that I feel like I can share, and so he gave me the opportunity to speak this weekend. And here's what I need you to know. In 1994, the 94-95 season, the best basketball team in the history of my high school was formed. We started five juniors. One of them was a Broadbeck. That year, we made it all the way to regionals, almost to state. The following year, the 95-96 season, we were ranked number one in the state of Ohio in Division III basketball. We went 26-0 all the way to the state finals where we had one of those games where it just didn't come together, and we lost. So back in 95 and, uh, 95 and 96, there was also, uh, 94 and 95, there was also another team at Archibald. It was a freshman team. It also contained a Broadbeck. It was this guy right here. That was me. <laughs> My freshman team, we also set a record for Archibald High School. We went 0-15. We lost every single game. <laughs> My brother, he and his buddies were on the very best team in the history of our school. And I, well, I was on the worst team in the history of our school. The difference between my brother and I, well, it was stark. He was listed in the program at six foot three. But basketball coaches do that. They lie for intimidation. He was really about six two. But he was 200 pounds. He could move some guys. I was listed in the program as five six. That was also a lie. More like five three. 100 pounds, soaking wet. My uh, sophomore year, I got to play junior varsity, and if you played well enough in the junior varsity game, you got to dress in the varsity games. And so my brother's team was so good, they were winning games by 30 and 40 points every time they would go out, which meant when I got to dress varsity, I would get to play in the varsity game. And the local radio announcers, it would sound like this every time I got in the game. The one guy would say, oh, and Kurt Broadbeck checked into the game. And then Larry Christie would chime in, who was the, the commentator. He'd say, certainly doesn't look like his brother, does he? <laughs> Every time. One time he said, I wonder if they share the same parents. Uh, which was like, oh. We were just, you know, puberty. It just wasn't there for me. So here's what we're going to talk about today, though. In line with that, we're going to talk about growth. Because the growth between me and my brother, it was stark. Both physically and in the game of basketball. But in order to talk about growth, we need to talk about a guy named Saul, whose later his name was turned to Paul, okay? So we're going to use Saul's story to talk about spiritual growth. I want you to hear how Saul described himself. So we're going to start in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to get into verse 4, and he says, I myself have reasons for such confidence. Here's who he was. If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh. 
I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He said, if anyone is religious, me, God's chosen person, of the best tribe, of the best people, that's who I am, Saul says. Then he says, in regard to the law, God's law, he's like, I'm a Pharisee. I am the elite. I understand the law better than anyone. As for zeal, I persecuted the church that came up against us. As for legalistic righteousness, I am faultless. So as I said, we're gonna talk about spiritual growth, and if we're gonna talk about spiritual growth, maybe there's some of you in this room and you're going, you know what? I've gone to church my entire life. Is he talking to me? And I would say, well, we're gonna look at the story of a man who had everything together when it comes to religion. He had it all figured out, yet his journey was just about to begin. And I would say maybe, if you've been in church a long time, maybe, just maybe, today is for you because maybe God has something greater in store for your relationship with him and you need to lean into it. But in order to get there, we gotta talk about four things and here's kind of the playbook for today. We're gonna talk about murder because why wouldn't you talk about that in church, okay? We're then gonna talk about referees, which for some of you, especially Purdue fans, I saw you on Facebook last night, you think referees are worse than murderers, all right, okay? We're gonna talk about handles, not the ice cream. We'll figure that out when we get there. And then we're gonna talk about picket fence, okay? But let's start talking about murder. I was a child of the 80s. Anybody else a child of the 80s? Everybody younger than that's like, man, you are old up there, dude. Yeah, these high schoolers down here raise their hand. Like, you wish, like Stranger Things is all you got from the 80s. And it's, <laughs> so child of the 80s, there were two TV shows that came on that were terrifying to me as a child of the 80s. One was called Unsolved Mysteries. And the other one was America's Most Wanted. Everybody remember those? When those came on the TV and you saw those as a kid, you were convinced, oh my goodness, the murderer has to live in my little town of 4,000 people, and he's here hiding, and I'm going to die. And you never wanted to watch that show. Fast forward 35 years, now people seem fascinated with this kind of stuff. Any true crime podcasters in the place? Raise your hand at all of our campuses. Yeah, crime junkies? My wife is a crime junkie. I don't think she's ever murdered anybody, <laughs> but she is the best murderer that I know. She can listen to the podcast, and then she will give me the recap, and she will tell me, man, they were so dumb. Everybody knows that when you murder somebody, you leave your cell phone at home so that they can't ping you and tell you where it is. Or they're like, can you believe how they disposed of the body? If they had just done this, they would have got away with it. And I sleep next to her. <laughs> it's scary. In the fall, she asked me, she's like, what is your life insurance policy? And I'm like, <laughs> and why am I telling you? Because I'm telling a couple thousand people today, if I die, <laughs> and we can't figure out who it was, it was her, okay? That's why we're talking about it. But we're also talking about it because we're talking about a guy named Saul. And who was Saul? We already said he was religious, but he has a story. You see, there was a guy named Stephen. Stephen was, was one of the early disciples. As he's one of the early disciples, right after Jesus had rose from the dead, he's going about pronouncing him as the Messiah. Well, the religious leaders of the day did not like that. He's speaking something other than the law that they knew, claiming that Jesus was the Messiah, so they have him stoned. And who was the person who was given the authority to have this man stoned? Saul. Let's read about it in Acts chapter 8. It says, And Saul was there, giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women, and he put them in prison. Murder. This dude was bad. Yet, 
God has something in store for him. There may be some of you who have joined us today that you're going, man, if anybody knew who they were sitting next to, if anybody knew the secrets that I contain, if anybody knew my past, they would say, why are you in a church today? And I would say, oh, you're here because Jesus has called you here, because he has a plan for you, he has a purpose for you, and not one of us, not one of us is perfect. The Bible tells us that every one of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that this message, well, it's for all of us, from the one who's been a part of Jesus for, since they were a little child to the one who maybe today showed up and goes, I don't even know why I'm here, but I got invited to talk about basketball. But let's read what happens. We'll move to Acts chapter 9. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest. And he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. He said, I am Jesus. Whom you are persecuting, he replied, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Now we read that going further, if you read your Bible for yourself, you read that then the Lord appears to a guy named Ananias, and he says, Ananias, I need you to go find this guy named Saul, and I need you to put your hands on him and pray for him. And Ananias says, no. Saul? I know about that guy. He's a bad dude, and Jesus is like, well, you're going to do it anyway. And so we read on. It says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. He placed his hands on Saul, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, was baptized. After taking some food, he regained his strength. So I tell you that story because if we're going to talk about spiritual growth, we need to talk about maybe the beginning. Now, there may be some of you here who maybe you have not encountered Jesus yet. You would say, hey, I showed up to church, but I'm not even sure what it means to put my faith and trust in Jesus. Here's what I need you to know. There is a God who loves you, who has a plan and a purpose for you. He created you, and he put good inside of you. Yet at the same time, he gave you free will. And you have the choice to choose to follow after Jesus or to follow after your own desires. And every one of us have to make that choice for ourselves. And there may be some of you that are going, I don't know if I'm ready to make that decision or I am ready to make that decision. I'm going to give you one simple step today. And that is this. If you would pull your phone out and just text the word yes to 85379. Here's why. We've put together a series of videos of what it means to follow Jesus. And if we're going to ask you and say, hey, you ought to put your faith in Jesus, I would want you to know exactly what it means to put your faith in Jesus and what that would mean for you and for your life and how you could receive salvation from Jesus. And so if today is your day to do that, don't be ashamed. Just pull out your phone, text the word yes to 85379 and get those videos because just like Saul, it didn't matter what he had done, God still had a plan for him and we're gonna learn more about that. But I want you to do that. But we need to move on because we need to talk about referees. Um, and I thought if we're gonna talk about referees, um, well, then we need someone with some credibility. So I would like you to welcome my friend Tommy Short out to the platform, please. I gotta tell you, Kurt, as a former referee, I'll never get used to people clapping and applauding when I walk out, so this is The first is a time unique... he walked out, he yeah. was like, whoa, didn't expect that, thought we were gonna get some booze. Um, so Tommy, we are gonna talk about referees, but here's, here's what I need to know. So why would you ever choose a profession where the moment you walk out, there are two people that don't like each other, but the one thing they have in common is their hatred for you. I thought actually that's why you and CJ invited me here so everybody could agree on one thing and put a referee <laughs> up there. So um, yeah, very unique uh, path to choose to go down. Um, the only thing I can think of is that when I was in sixth grade, um, I probably led the league in technical fouls if they kept track. Um, but I always appreciated the referees that came up and talked to me. Uh, never agreed with anything they said in full transparency, but I appreciated that they, they came and spoke to me and told me 
<clears throat> excuse me, what I did wrong. And I thought, I can never to this day remember any of those referees' names, but it was the series of those conversations during the sixth grade season, and I thought, you know what? I wanna do that one day. You know, some have a dream to play in the NBA. Mine was, was to referee, and I think as believers, I don't wanna gloss over the point that we need to be intentional with our actions and our words because we never know whether it's at work or at home in our neighborhood that someone sees what we're doing and says, you know what, one day I'd like to do that. Oh, um, and I was fortunate. I got to referee almost two decades. Uh, the last 10 at the Division I level, college, uh, men's basketball, and refereed in all over the country in the Big 12, American, Atlantic 10, Missouri Valley, Horizon League, got fired in some of those, got rehired. Um, Got to spend seven straight Christmases in Hawaii refereeing the Diamond Head Classic, which that's not a terrible way to spend Christmas. Back-to-back um, -back OVC championships. And the, the final thing I'll say about that is the world that I came from was, was high pressure, right? Every time I blew the whistle, I had 15,000 opinions on what I did wrong, right? And I had to be really good for 38 minutes, but I had to be perfect in the last two because if I wasn't, I would end up on SportsCenter or YouTube and all of you would be sharing the clip of, look what this guy did. So, and then the highlight, um, working with our men's Olympic team in FIBA and traveling overseas and working with the 2012 and 2016 Olympic team. Yeah, so I think we have a picture of the uh, Olympic team um, that they're putting up there. There's a few names that <laughs> people might recognize on that uh, picture, but I thought it'd be good to share a story to get started. So. Um, why don't you tell us the story of the best game that you ever officiated? Okay, I'm gonna bring this one to life. Do it. So, as, as retiring from officiating and, and, and now speaking, that's the number one question I get from fans, right? It's like, what's, what's the biggest game? And I'm, I'm from Indiana, didn't go to Indiana, my wife did, but if I'm talking to a Hoosier fan, they're like, you ever do a game in Assembly Hall as if like, that's the only place that they play college basketball? No offense, Hoosier fans. Um, but I answer that question as the, the biggest game I ever refereed was with that team in a practice. And people are always like, practice? And, and I'll share this story. And they put the picture up there of the team. And for basketball fans, the 92 Dream Team will never be duplicated. But in my lifetime, and I'm 40, that 2012 team, that's in second place and it's not close, I promise you. And the starting lineup was Kobe, LeBron, Carmelo, Chris Paul, and Tyson Chandler. The second unit, when they were all still teammates at Oklahoma City, Durant, Westbrook, Harden, Darren Williams was the point guard, Blake Griffin got hurt the week before in Vegas, so they bring in some guy, uh, Anthony Davis, you might have heard of him, uh, 19 decent. years old, never played in the NBA, but they bring him in as kind of the 12th man, and then Kevin uh, Love and Andre Iguodala. So here I am, this is my first practice, and quick show of hands, who's seen the documentary on Netflix, The Redeem Team, about the 2008 team? Okay. All those stories about practice, it's like the Loch Ness Monster. I've been involved with two different teams. They're all true, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So we do this two and a half hour closed practice with, with the 2012 team. And then Coach K is like, hey, we need to do situations. And, and for non-basketball fans, we're gonna do plays where the shot clock's at four seconds and each team gets a chance to figure out what they would do in that situation. And to this day, I've re-encountered this play in my mind hundreds of times, and I don't know where Kobe came from other than I know he was one of the 10 on the court, okay? And so fans will ask me, hey, did you ever get caught up in the game? Like you're around some of the best college and pro players to ever play the game. What a, what a cool experience. Did you ever get caught up? And there was one time, and it's the play I'm about to explain, where the whistle literally fell out of my mouth and I was in shock. So Anthony Davis comes off a screen and he catches it right below the free throw line about three or four feet, and he's gonna go in for an uncontested two-handed dunk. Kobe comes, don't know where, and proceeds to two-hand shove Anthony Davis, his teammate, in a practice, and Anthony Davis goes 10, 12, 15 feet out of bounds. In a real game, I wouldn't have wasted the fans' time, because I know how much you love officials at the monitor. I wouldn't even had to go to the monitor to, to eject Kobe. I would have thrown Kobe out immediately. And I was just in shock. And after that, and I'm not gonna repeat because of where we are right now, what Kobe said to Anthony Davis, to Coach K, to Coach Beheim, and the rest of the team. And he said, if you're not willing to play to my standard, don't get on the plane and come to London. Because we're not gonna, if you're gonna do that in practice, what are you gonna do in the game? And so that was a real eye-opening moment to show, even at that level with future Hall of Famers, there's still another level of preparation. Yeah.
So hold on to that thought, because we'll talk again about Kobe and his practice preparation, because that's important for our conversation later, but that's such a good story. But eventually you say, okay, this career, um, I need to switch, switch some things. So talk a little bit about that, switching your career and why. Yeah, so we started to have kids um, back in 2019, and so it was kind of on my heart when the 2019 season started that it was probably time. And I don't know if any of you can relate, but you know, a lot of times what we do for a living is, is who we are. We're not able to separate the who and the do. And I can tell you, my identity wasn't tied to officiating. My identity was officiating. Mm. My first mentor, John Adams, who passed away um, at the end of last year, he told me when he hired me at 19 that your priorities ought to be in this order. And I didn't understand it at 19, but I do now. He said, faith should be number one, your family should be number two, your career should be number three, and then find time for officiating at number four. Kurt, if we would have met five years ago when I was still refing, even last year, I would have told you outwardly, those are my priorities. But my feet didn't match my mouth. Mm. Because the reality was, my priorities were officiating was one, two, and three. If I had time for God, my family, and my career, they found time at number four. I missed weddings, funerals, birthday parties, important events in my life, but they weren't that important because officiating was my identity. Mm. And as I look back, I was in control when I was an official. I might not have verbalized it, but I was telling you, I don't need God. Wow. I'm in control, I've got this. Look at all the success that I have. I'm on TV, look at my games, right? But the reality was God didn't need me. Hmm. He That's wanted good. me, but he didn't need me. That's good. And so I had to ask myself two questions, and I'll challenge all of you with these questions. And they, I hope they make you a little bit uncomfortable. And number one, what am I chasing? And number two, what am I more concerned with? And number one, am I chasing trophies, which sit on the shelf, or am I chasing Jesus, which shapes myself? Wow. Because the trophies are about me and my plan. But Jesus is about getting in the word and prayer, and that's expanding his kingdom. And then number two, what am I more concerned with? Am I more concerned with random letters behind my name, or am I more concerned with the red letters proclaiming his name? Mm. Come on. My Letters behind my name, those don't mean anything. That's just about me. The red letters proclaiming his name, that's what shapes our growth. That's what expands his kingdom. That's what matters, not basketball games. Easiest interview ever. Um, so you embarked on a crazy journey in August. Why don't you share what you were doing for this year? They already thought I was nuts. I don't yeah, know what yeah, they're gonna throw it now. out there. So, Back in August, uh, just after being attached to my cell phone for, for so many years, I decided to give up my cell phone for an entire year. So I'm, I think today's day 225, we started August 6th. So not smartphone to flip phone, like no cell phone. Like I'm all in, I'm not toes in the water. And what really came to me about two weeks into this journey was, I thought this was, and I had true intentions. I wanted to become more intentional in my life. I wanted to create more time for those that matter, the relationships, my career. But God was saying, <laughs> you thought this was about a phone? Watch what I can do in your life if you put that away. Mm. Watch what I can do. And I can tell you the only reason I'm sitting here right now sharing my story with you is because of the phone and putting it away. And the first day you put away the phone yep. was the first day that you came to Northview, right? Yep. And give us some stats on the phone about the average. Let's make people uncomfortable about okay. their phones real quick. Give us some Let's stats. Let's just keep it going. On, I've got the stripes on, 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 might as well. uh, on how the average American uses their phone. And I can share this because I was one of the statistics. Okay, so this isn't old man yelling, get off my lawn. The average person spends four and a half, day, four and a half days, four and a half hours on their phone, non-work related each day. The average person will check their phone 144 times a day. That means once every seven minutes that you're awake. 89% of people will reach for their phone the minute within waking up. And 75% of people will respond to any notification on their phone, whether it's social media, text, email, within five minutes. So Pastor CJ often says, time flies, but you're the pilot. And sometimes our time gets hijacked from us. And in the spiritual growth conversation, keep that in mind as we talk about the time we have to invest in our relationship with Jesus. All right, Tommy, I want you to jump in, though, because you had a kind of a defining moment of your life and in your spiritual journey in October. Would you please share that with everybody? Yeah. Um, 
so that Sunday that, as, as Kurt referenced, uh, the first day that I started the no phone journey was the first day that my beautiful wife and two girls, we started coming here regularly, which I don't believe is a coincidence. And that series was titled How to Pick a Fight, which selfishly as a referee, I could have given that whole series and I've never spoken on, on a pulpit before. But Yeah, you're good at that. Yeah, <laughs> you can ask a lot of coaches around the country. But CJ really shared three things that I encourage all of you to go back and watch this message because it had a profound impact on me and, and the story I'm about to share with you. But CJ said three things that day. Number one, life will jolt you at some point. Number two, whatever's inside of you will come out of you regardless of who is around you. And number three, anytime we encounter a problem, we have three choices. We can go inward and suppress, we can go outward and place blame, or we can go upward and talk to God. And so, great service that Sunday, October 22nd. Go home after service, and we were planning on going downtown. We have two, two small girls uh, to Zubu. And um, I'd had panic attacks before in college, and it started again. The, the tightness in my chest, and, and now it's in my throat and in my jaw, and this feels different. This doesn't feel like a panic attack. And, the, my fingers are, are numb, and, uh, and I took pride, Kurt, as an official, in chaotic situations of being the sense of calm. And so I just went up to my wife as my two girls are sitting at the kitchen table and positioned myself in front of them so they wouldn't hear or see, and I just said, Andrea, call 911. I don't want the girls to get scared, but this doesn't feel like a panic attack. I think I'm having a heart attack. And so I had taken an ambulance to IU North and they were busy that day. So I was actually in the hallway next to a wall. And they didn't let my wife back for about an hour and a half or, or, or two hours. And um, I just, I, re I remember audibly yelling out loud, I feel so alone. Hmm. I went inward. And I remember hearing from God and he said, I've never left your side. Hmm. And, and I'm hooked up to all these monitors and IVs and everything else and doctors are running around with the nurses and I scream out again, am I having a heart attack? This doesn't like, I'm, you guys aren't reassuring me, what's going on? And they said, we're, we're working on it, Let, you know, we're trying to figure it out, just stay calm. And, I remember God saying, your physical heart's fine. You're here for your spiritual heart. Mm -hmm. And that's mine. And then lastly, and I, I've, heard, I've heard people talk about this, and I saw double doors in the, in the distance, that the last thing that some people see is, is a light. And to this day, I couldn't tell you how I never saw those double doors when I came in. I, don't, I never remember seeing them, but shortly thereafter, I saw them open and it was a bright sunny day, and I saw a light. But this time I didn't, I didn't yell. I did what CJ said, I went upward. Hmm. And I said, God, I don't, I don't know how to pray. I don't even know what to say. But I'm ready to be at your service. Hmm. And whatever I need to do, I'm all in. And I share that story, and I told Kurt this earlier, and this is just on my heart right now. A couple of weeks ago, CJ and Mark asked me if I'd be willing to come up here and, and share some of this. And my prayer every day since then, even this morning, was God, don't let anyone who hears what I say become enamored with basketball stories or even what you're doing in my life because that's not the point of any of this. Cause them to be curious of what you can do in their life, not mine. And last night, I was out in the lobby with, with my wife and girls and I could see this lady in, in the distance. and she, she wanted to come up to me and she was holding all the first time visitor stuff in her hands. And she came up, she started crying. She said, 
my friends invited me and I didn't know if I was gonna come, but I ended up coming. And I think I came because of God. Yeah. And that alone made all of what I've gone through so far, that was all worth it, that one person heard what I had to share. Yeah, yeah. And I just love that moment. Thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for telling your story. And I love how you just took your story and you said, okay, so what about you? Like, this was my all-in moment for God. When's yours coming? Um, and I think, I hope you'd take that challenge. Um, but I need to close this interview with one more question, okay? So we gotta turn a hard corner because you gotta help me out. Okay. So um, you were a good referee, but you are not Jesus. That means you were not perfect. That means you made bad calls. I liked him until this point. And so at the end of the game, um, I'm sure you've made some calls, and, and I've heard many fans do this. We would have won that game if we weren't playing six on five uh, or eight on five if stripes was actually not for the homers, you know, whatever it might be, right? So what do the best coaches and the best players say to you when you make those bad calls? Well, in the moment, they do say, you're terrible and I won't repeat what they say and there's, they're, they're caught up. But I understand in the moment because it's high stakes and there's a lot involved. You're, you're dealing with people's livelihoods. I, I understand that. I put myself in their shoes. But the best of the best are able to take a step back after that moment of emotional pull and they realize it wasn't just one call. And I know as fans, you'll find that hard to believe, but there's not one call that I ever made, whether it was in the first few minutes or the last few minutes, that decided a game. And the best coaches and players will realize, you know what? We missed 12 free throws. We had 17 turnovers. We didn't get any of the 50-50 loose balls. And we missed nine box outs. So yeah, that one call, it was with 20 seconds to go, but that, that didn't decide it. And I think the point I, I'd like to leave you with is the best of the best, regardless if you're an official or a pastor, or whatever it is, if you're always looking outside to blame someone, you're gonna be looking for a long time. And until you can go inward, and look of how I can improve. Because it might not be my fault, but it is my responsibility to grow and to get better. That's good. One of the greatest coaches of all time, his name was John Wooden. He was also one of the hardest on referees, if you learn more about his story. But John Wooden said this, you're not a failure until you start blaming others for your mistakes. Hey, uh, hold on to that thought, but we need to get Tommy off the platform. Now, Tommy, you, you cheered for him on the way in, but his love language is booze. So would you do me a favor and boo Tommy off the platform, Come please? Come on. <laughs> when it comes to conversation about spiritual growth, it is really easy it's really easy for us to be like, I would be growing, except this happened to me. Let's go back to our friend, Paul, okay? We now are gonna go into 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. He says this, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and the night in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger from the city, in danger from the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled. I've gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've gone without food. I have been cold and naked besides everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul says, hey, if anyone has an excuse for why they are not pursuing Jesus with their whole heart, I have it. I was doing this thing. I thought I was religious. I was actually doing these things that were deceiving and against God. I met Jesus. My life should now be perfect. And it's not. I keep getting thrown in prison for doing the right thing. I've been shipwrecked. I could blame God for this. I've been flogged. 
I've been spit on. I've gone hungry. I've gone thirsty. Why, why, why did all this happen to me? And you know what? Do we do that as well? Man, I would be growing in my faith if that church it failed me. That pastor, he let me down. That mentor, he stopped noticing me. Ah, oh, COVID derailed me. My career got too busy. Time just got away from me. I would be growing in my faith, but it was everyone else's fault. We quickly fall into this victim mentality. But when it comes to our faith, we need to be victors. We need to own it ourselves, which is why we need to talk about the next thing, which is handles. Because in the game of, the bas- in the game of basketball, handles means your ball handling skills. Now, I told you, my brother, he was bigger than me, but him and all his buddies played basketball in my driveway all the time, and I wanted to be part of the game, but I was tiny. So I learned pretty early on, if I want to play with them, I got to develop some skills on my own that allow me to be part of the game. So in third grade and fourth grade, when everybody else could just dribble with their dominant hand, I was out in the driveway dribbling with my left hand over over and over again. I needed to develop some ball handling skills so that I could be part of the game even though I wasn't physically big enough to be part of the game. I needed to develop some fundamentals in my life. There's a coach. His name is Bobby Knight. Anybody heard of Bobby Knight? Love him or hate him. You've heard of him, especially from Indiana. Bob Knight says this, the key is not the will to win. Everybody has that. It's the will to prepare to win that's important. Michael Jordan said this, if you get the fundamentals down, the level of everything else you do, well, it will rise. So what are the fundamentals when it comes to owning your spiritual growth? What are the things that you need to be doing? Here's what I would say. I would call them just this, simply the big three. You meet in gatherings, you need to be in groups, you need to be a part of generosity. Here's what I mean by that, gatherings. You need to make weekly church attendance a priority. Some of you go, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And I'm like, you don't. But it's a pretty wise thing to do, to get under the leadership of a church who's gonna ground you with biblical truth every single week. And you need to make it a priority because you will go the rest of your week hearing about relative truth throughout your life. And you need a place that's gonna continue to remind you and center you. You also need to be in a group Because I already told you, group life, it's where you learn to live out what the sermon just called out. It's where you get surrounded by other people who are going to push you and motivate you to be growing in your faith. And if you're not in a group, get on the app, look through the group finder tool, and join one today. You need to be part of generosity. And what I mean by generosity is you need to be generous with your time, your talents, and your treasure. Many people think the key to spiritual growth is to fill your head with knowledge. That is not the key to spiritual growth. It's to put action to your feet. And the more you start walking out your faith, the faster you will grow. Head knowledge does very little but puff you up. But the moment you start serving like Jesus, then you begin to grow and accelerate your faith. And again, you can go on the app. You can take a test drive to serve at our church or in our community through one of our local partners just by clicking the test drive portion of the app because you need to be taking action steps. God's word. If you do not have a Bible, you would walk out the doors at any of our auditoriums and go to the information center and we will give you a Bible and we will help you learn how to start reading this for yourself because you have to take the fundamentals into your own hands. If you don't know how to pray, Grab a campus pastor. Today is miracle prayer. Come forward and receive miracle prayer afterwards and talk to that person about how do I develop a prayer life for myself. Those are some fundamentals. Paul, he said it this way in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself may not be disqualified for the prize. Kobe, you heard it. He practiced. 
hard. He took the fundamentals and he practiced like a maniac so that he could be the best. And I'm just telling you, all of us, if we were to own our spiritual disciplines, own our next step in our spiritual journey and not just rest and wait for something to happen, but to say, no, I'm gonna get proactive in becoming more and more like Jesus. I'm gonna take a next step today. Well, then the ball will be in your hands and you will be able to take the shot and it will be nothing but that.